Well, thank you very much. It, it, it is an honor. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to be here uh, to tell you about uh, my my lessons and universal lessons. Hopefully, we all can can take from them. Um, to get to the, the basics, uh, this talk is my own. It doesn't represent the government of my country um, or any pharmaceutical company uh, <laughs> or, or my wife. Uh, it's me. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, well, first we talk about how we think about disability because that sets up the, the whole discussion. And then the challenges and strategies uh, which we face when we seek to universally design or accommodate um, the technical challenges, some of the conceptual challenges, um, and how we've managed to accommodate along the way, and, and hopefully leave you with some parting, parting ideas. So only when the design fails does it draw attention to itself. When it succeeds, it's invisible. So I was a medical student. Uh, I was on my pediatrics rotation and doing a uh, well child check of about a, a seven or eight year old. Um, Turns out his father was a pediatrician as well, and, and his father asked his son afterwards, um, how, how did it go? Uh, what did you think? And the kid said, it was, it was fine. I just I wonder what the dog was for. And I had a seeing eye dog with me in the room. Um, so the, the child knew uh, that the encounter went fine, and the design, the accommodating for the disability was nearly invisible to the child. So what's a normal day for me? Well, I get up, I make my tea in the microwave with braille labeled buttons. I work with my seeing eye dog to get to the bus stop. I can track the bus with a mobile app on my accessible phone. The bus kneels has an extending ramp and space for wheelchairs. On the way to the office, there's an audible street crossing uh, to ensure safety. The rooms in the building where I work have braille labeling. I load up a screen reading software on my computer. I look up a chart. I walk down to the waiting room, and I get on with my quote unquote normal day. Uh, the design is transparent at many of these levels. So who are we designing for? I think this is a, a good reminder that as we consider disability, we need to simultaneously consider strength. We have Marley Matlin, a actress with a, a hearing impairment or who's deaf. We have Franklin Roosevelt, who had paralysis from polio. Ray Charles, who is blind. And Michael Phelps, uh, who has ADHD um, and is an amazing Olympic athlete. So while we're thinking about disability, we simultaneously need to think about strength. So how do we think about this? In order to get where we're going, we need to have a sense of where we are. So I thought it would be fun to do a, a thought experiment from the point of view of a blind person, thinking about what I like to call the photonically dependent. Uh, so these are people, quote unquote, normal people, uh, with normal or near normal visual acuity. They use their visual systems for most daily tasks. Um, and there's a lot of required design elements that these people need. They like lighting in indoor and outdoor areas, right? Uh, they use these large painted illuminated signs. Um, they use these cumbersome computer displays, large televisions, uh, bulky to carry around. A, a braille display is, is, is tiny, or audio output is even smaller. They like projected presentations, as you can see here. Um, and there's entire industries of dyes, paint colors, fashion, which, which digital publishing, museums, which accommodate these folks. So it reminds us that when we design, we have to take account of where we're actually starting from and what we're taking for granted. So how do we think about disability, or how have we thought about disability? I think this is a model which most people can identify with at some level. I call it the computational model of disability. So if you want to put it in computer talk, if a student minus the effect of the disability plus the effect of accommodation is greater than the task, then you have something that's accessible. If you take um, the student, subtract the disability, add accommodation, and it's not over the hurdle, then something's not accessible. It's, it's easy, it's sort of 
you know, even the word disability, it, it fits with how we tend to traditionally think about this. Now, how might this work in a universal design context? Well, everybody gets the benefit of the UDL design. So you start out providing that to all students. Then you add in the effect of the student. Um, you, again, subtract out the effect of the disability, and you decide whether accommodation has happened. Now, in many cases, you may not need additional accommodation. Uh, that's, that's the goal. Perhaps your UDL accommodation was an electronic text and a person likes Braille. You know, maybe there are ways that, that additional accommodation is, is needed beyond that. But it, it provides a way to fold UDL into how we might traditionally think about um, the process of accommodation. So what are the benefits of this kind of model? Well, you know, it places the student under a microscope, right? Uh, it's, it's simple. It gives us a nice formula, something to check off, some, some way to think about this in a simple and direct way. Uh, there are clear relationships. It fits. It fits how we, how we think about the world and how we think about disability, fundamentally, unless we check ourselves. Um, it gives us clear targets, ways to intervene. But what are its limitations? Well, it assumes the quantities are static. Can a student's abilities improve over the course of your course? Is the task really fixed? Is the task well defined? Uh, it assumes the disability is negative. I, I know of a young lady, um, she's visually impaired. She works for the FBI, uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigations in the US, interpreting um, forensic audio. So she has to listen to a sound and say, was that an M16 or an AK-47? Um, and you, I would be hard pressed to say that her visual disability causes her any disability in that context. Uh, it assumes that the measurements we made under the microscope are accurate. And it didn't, unless you think of it as providing the UDL framework, it provides no other direct role for the, the educator. And for each kind of disability, you sort of have to rerun the computation. So how else could we think about this? Well, we would want any model, the best model, should be simple, as simple as possible. Good old Occam's razor. Um, it should acknowledge the role of all parties, not just, not just the student. And it should incorporate what each can bring to the table. And implies that the ultimate goal is a combination in a dynamic, interactive process. So thinking about this visually, as you have the educator and you have the student in space trying to, to come together. Each has their own strengths. Each is starting from a different place. And the goal is, is this meeting, meeting in the middle. Now, how can we think about that from a UDL context, perhaps? Well, we can build in structure that aids the coming together of these two parties. So it facilitates their interaction and coming together and learning happening. <coughs> so how do these ideas bear out in, in my personal experience through higher education in medicine and science? Well, I was about 18. I was entering the University of Notre Dame. And I went into a meeting with the heads of all the departments that I would study under. And they sat on one side of a large, oak table, and my family and I sat on the other. My seeing eye dog was tucked underneath. And the head of the biology department slid a book across that great table, open to a picture much like this. And he said, how is he going to learn this? It was a little intimidating as an 18 year old, as you might imagine. What's he asking? Well, he might have been asking, if I had access to UDL uh, and knew you were coming, how might we have set this up better, right? That's one way. He could have been trying to, f to flip the situation, right? Teach me. T teach me. I'll be your student. Let, let me know how this works, which is a position that facilitates communication when you start from that, that stance of humility. He may have been, or he may have been challenging me. How is he going to learn this? Challenges are reality for, for those with with disabilities, and this may have been one of, those, one of those challenges. So what kind of challenges do we face? Well, we face the technical challenges, and that 
comes from the notion that the disability is a functional biological problem. And these can often be addressed through the appropriate use of tools, technology, adaptive techniques. The other is the conceptual challenges. And these are, come from the inaccuracies that people might have about people with disabilities. So the idea is that the disability results from the societal limitations imposed on the person with the particular functional limitation. And sometimes these are harder to recognize and address. But ultimately, success depends on recognizing both. And by providing a UDL framework to achieve the accommodation of the first set, over time, the, the second set of challenges may, may be addressed. So how do we address challenges? Well, there's technology. There's, there's the exceedingly simple, uh, things like writing Braille manually with a slate and stylus. There's complex, there's computer solutions and, and amazing internet technology. There's techniques, there's attitudes, there's how we approach these problems. For me, one of the important stages in my life, I was around 16, and my friends in the States, that's when you can start driving an automobile. So they were getting their driver's licenses and sharing in the, the freedom that that allows. And that was the time I chose to go get a seeing eye dog or a dog guide. And when I trained with that dog, I realized it was my statement that this is who I am, this is what I have to work with, and this is how I choose to do things. And my freedom came from pairing with that dog and making that statement of acceptance. So acceptance is a powerful tool to address these challenges. So we need to think broadly about tools. Um, there's the core skills of disability, maybe that's reading lips, maybe that's writing braille, reading braille. The technical skills, using computers, which is a necessity these days. Maybe it's what you know from performance arts that can fold into how you learn things. Maybe it's athleticism, hobbies, particular things that, that the student brings that nobody else does that could be brought to bear. Um, and the, the personal attributes, motivation, how, how ready is the person? Are they ready to be persistent? You know, one of my favorite qu quotes from Churchill is, success is going from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. Right, do they have that persistence? Do they have the willingness, the, the notion that I will try? I don't know if it'll succeed, but I know I will keep trying. Or the ability to adapt, to say let's, let's find another way to solve this problem. So tools are ubiquitous. This is a, a picture of, of my iPhone. Let's just take a quiz here. Is this a text scanner? So I can point this at a page of text and have it read out loud. A color identifier, it can tell me what color my pants are in the morning. Light probe, I can point it at a, a blinking light on a machine to know if I say I have messages. An object recognizer, there's software that I've trained to let it tell me if I'm drinking the decaf or the regular coffee. A money identifier, um, it could tell me a five euro, euro note yesterday when I was in a, in a cafe. Uh, a portable magnifier for those with, with some usable vision, a navigation tool to help help a blind person find what street they're on and where they're going, a book reader, of course, an accessible calculator. When I was going through school, that was a separate costly option that a blind person needed to buy, an accessible alarm clock, a flashlight, or even I hear it works as a phone. So, <laughs> so sometimes the newest tools aren't the best. This is an Opticon. So this was designed in the 1970s, um, around when I was born. Um, and what it does is it takes the image through a small postage stamp sized camera and makes a pin display vibrate according to what it sees in black and white. So when it came to organic chemistry class, I realized I needed to interpret line spectra and I needed to interpret uh, drawings of chemical structures. So we reached back into the archives, asked around, thought about techniques, and said, well, with the willingness, let's try this. Let's see how it works. And so this tool, which is in, in some ways incredibly simple, um, but older, was the tool we needed for the job. So how else did we adapt? Well, we used things like 
models of skeletons and heart and brain models, clay models when we needed to, um, the same organic chemistry models that other people use to click together to know the relationship between atoms and bonds, uh, simple plastic raised line drawing kits. So I would work with a reader who would find a picture in the text and they would copy it in raised line onto a, a raised line drawing kit and tell me what they what they were drawing, and in that way I could learn the, the structures of molecules and relationships in biology. There's veterinary syringes I used at the time which could dispense a predetermined volume of liquid I could use in the laboratory. Uh, now there's this iLab project based in the States that makes a variety of accessible lab equipment, things like pH meters, color detectors, spectrometers, um, and with Bluetooth and other common interfaces, the ability to have these machines talk to accessible equipment is, is even higher now. Um, so that head of the biology department caught me on campus about six months later after our initial talk. Uh, and after he told me to cut my hair because he thought I looked like a hippie, uh, <laughs> he said, you know what, Tim, if I gave, I wonder if I gave every student in your class dark glasses if they would do as well as you would. Um, because he was quite pleased, quite pleased with my performance. So let's, let's try to put on uh, those glasses and, and maybe even see through this professor's eyes. So we talked about the technical challenges. What are the conceptual challenges? Well, I am a psychiatrist, so I'm going to talk about countertransference. So this is how a therapist or perhaps a teacher feels about a particular student or patient or group of students or patients. Uh, and it needs to be brought into conscious awareness so it doesn't unduly influence us. So we all see things through our own lens. Imagine those photonically dependent people we talked about earlier. And so in order to design or accommodate, we have to start by knowing what, what we carry with us. Uh, it's not just the functional disability, it's the perception of that disability. So this is what I call the, if I can't do it without that sensorability, then dot, dot, dot. Um, so I was interviewing for residency. I had completed a PhD. I, I was published, I had completed med school um, in the, um, the upper portion of my class. Um, graduating with honors, um, and I was at a somewhat prestigious psychiatry residency. I'd finished interviewing there. I'd finished with my day of interviews, you know, six or seven hours, and then they came and talked to me, and they said, Tim, the chair wants to talk with you. So I waited in the chair's waiting room for a while and was ushered in uh, to talk to the chair of the Department of Psychiatry. I put my seeing eye dog to rest. I sat down. And the chair said to me, how are you going to assess a patient? I paused, I took a breath, and then I said, well, I can tell you you're not looking at me right now and you're reading your email. <laughs> and he spun around and he faced me and he said, how did you know that? See, he was falling into this, if I can't assess a patient without vision, how will you? He was falling into this trap, and through that exchange, the teacher became the student, and learning could actually begin. Now, what this fallacy neglects are the skills that the individual has acquired to compensate. I could hear from the direction of his voice. I could hear from the Microsoft Outlook chimes that were going off that he was not fully engaged with me. And it ignores the process of neuroplasticity, uh, which involves how the brain can remodel itself. So the brain is an amazing organ. If you guys found your way here today and can find your way home, your brain has changed. Your brain has changed the relationship among its synapses to accommodate new learning. This happens on the, the micro scale all the time, and it turns out it can happen on even, even larger scales too. So neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to reorganize itself 
by forming new neural connections throughout life. So it allows the brain to some degree to compensate for things like damage, loss, or changes in the environment. So for example, the occipital cortex, which processes visual information in sighted individuals, can become active when a blind person reads Braille. So the brain is kind of like a greedy real estate developer, right? It's not gonna let land go unused, okay? So the visual cortex is not getting input from the optic nerve, and in folks with, um, who are blind, when they read Braille, that area has been, has been taken over. So, so in another experiment, they took sighted folks, blindfolded them for five days, and they could see changes in their brain activation patterns. So that it became active in sensory and auditory tasks after only five days. So the, the visual cortex gets activated in braille reading and certain verbal memory tasks in some blind individuals. And the auditory cortex has been seen to be active in the deaf or hard of hearing when lip reading. So the brain has ways to accommodate, and if we fall into that, if I can't do it without that sensorability trap, we're, we're really barking up the wrong tree. So one way I learned to handle this, and actually was taught to handle this much earlier than I, was, than I can recall was, I was about a five or six year old, and I was fascinated by cars and airplanes and all these motorized things that you usually wouldn't want a, a blind person using. Um, and my folks were worried about this. They, they, so they went to an experienced teacher of the visually impaired, and they said, what do we do, what do we do about Tim? What do we do? And she said, in no uncertain terms, let him dream. It's kind of, you know, she knew that in order for something to be done, it had to be conceived of first. And if you stop at that conceptual phase, you will block out many pathways to achievement. So the, the conception isn't enough, but without it, you're, you're never going to get there. So it's almost like a great brainstorming session. You want to let every idea out, and then through time and effort, see, see what sticks. So what's another conceptual problem we get into? This is what I call the model trap. This happens when we confuse the model with reality. So for example, in an anatomy course, you might think the idea is to visually identify every nerve, muscle, blood vessel. But the actual function is to know what these are and where they are. And so identifying by touch was, is likely, likely congruent. Another one is thinking about the structure of a protein. So proteins exist at a scale smaller than the wavelength of light. So no one has ever seen the structure of a protein. But in the field, in biology, it's common to assume that people look at protein structures. So all models essentially are approximations. So this comes from a, a core must understanding, and I think they get this right in architecture much more often. Um, we confuse the function sometimes with the process. So the, the chair who said, how are you going to assess a patient, was assuming the model that assessment requires visual function. Um, and so we can avoid that by making sure we start with the fundamental goal or function well-defined. So this, this is done clearly in architecture where we say everybody should be able to go to the play but not necessarily walk down the steps. We, we, we've identified the important fundamental function. So I was at medical school. It was my first day there. I had just finished anatomy lab and, and done the best to to wash the smell of the, the cadavers off my hands. and uh, I was sitting down at lunch and a, a slightly more senior student came up to me and he said, why are you here? And, and I mumbled with a mouthful of sandwich, uh, isn't this where you're supposed to eat your lunch? <laughs> it's not what he meant. He meant, why, why are you here? What, what's driving you? What's, what's your purpose? So he was, again was providing some resistance, right? But resistance, as in muscle training, resistance helps us grow. Resistance in these cases can help us grow too. Uh, and Churchill once said, a kite flies highest against the wind. So 
when we face these challenges, whether technical or conceptual, we need to be able to see beyond them to the, to the well-defined goal. What is our purpose? Why are we here? And ultimately, what does accommodation, what does universal design, what does it allow us to achieve? So let's put all these ideas to a test. How could a blind person understand the three-dimensional structure of a protein? Here's a classic photonically dependent style model of, of a protein. Well, what do we have to work what do we have to do? What, what's what's the, the fundamental problem? Well, we need to provide a way to appreciate distances within the molecule. We need a way to understand spatial relationships, and we need to, a way to use a tool in near real time on multiple structures, as, as sighted folks do. So, well, what tools do we have in our toolkit? Well, we have technology. There's plenty of computing resources. There are publicly available routines for computer graphics, so we don't have to reinvent that wheel. Uh, my supervisor, Dr. Katrina Forrest, was interested, uh, which is always important, and I had her support in the project. Well, what techniques and skills did we have to bear? Well, I had auditory, spatial abilities, I had musical experience. This is one of those hobbies I talked about earlier, something that I brought to the table that maybe not everybody would, but everybody does have their unique strengths and abilities. And programming experience. So we threw that all together, and we developed a program called TIMBL, uh, Text Interface to Macromolecules, TIMBL. Um, so what it does is it lets someone explore the structure of a protein by moving a three-dimensional cursor in space, just as you might scroll through a web page or a Word document in two-dimensional space. And then it gives text output, which a lot of visually impaired folks are familiar with, and it gives atom names and identifiers so you know exactly what you're looking at. And then, on top of that, we combine that with the musical side using tones to indicate atoms, positions, and locations, giving clues to three-dimensional space. So things get louder and softer as they come towards and away from you uh, in the axis out of the page. Left and right are to your left and right ears, and vertically is with increases in pitch. And then we need to create an interface to communicate with folks who are used to the more traditional way of looking at proteins and build on graphics routines which show the three-dimensional cursor where the, the blind person is looking. So we actually did a, a small trial with this, found that um, people, it turns out people who were less familiar with the conventional models, as you might expect, uh, did better learning this new strategy than people who were, had bought into the, the standard paradigm. But people just using sound could identify common structural elements, one's called an alpha helix, um, at a, a, a rate statistically better than chance, and that with training it looks like this effect would increase. So we built a tool for blind people to study the structure of protein. Could this be used to know what's on the next floor up in the high rise? Sure. Or to interpret a magnetic resonance image? Sure. How did we do medical school? Well, this goes back to willingness. Once you decide something will be done, it becomes a matter of how. So you remove some of those degrees of freedom. Well, will we fail? Will we quit? Will we bail? No, it, it, will, it will be done. So I learned anatomy by touch. I felt all the muscle groups, the, the nerves, the blood vessels. I was the one to reach into the chest cavity up to my elbow and pull out the cadaver's lungs. Uh, all, all that sort of things. We used the raised line drawing kits, which we had um, used in the undergraduate education setting. I worked with visual describers, so they would tell me what they saw through the microscope, for example, uh, and we used screen readers to access the medical record. The course materials were available in electronic format, so that was quite easy uh, for me to, to uh, use as well. And in the clinical training, 
Well, we adapted elements of the physical exam to be done by touch. So you might watch someone go through their range of motion, but if I put my hands in particular places, I can feel the same musculoskeletal exam another physician saw. Um, I used that Opticon, the old technology, uh, to read EKGs. So I found that I could, I could look over an electrocardiogram and uh, determine elements of the patient's um, heart rhythm and those sort of things using the tool I had originally gathered to look at the structure of organic chemistry molecules. In surgery, I scrubbed in just like everyone else and the, the surgeon, you know, would say, okay, Tim, what, what is this? You know, that's, that's the appendix. That's the, uh, that's a portion of the colon, you know, and, and I, I did that like everyone else. I actually could find uh, blood vessels to link up um, in, a, in another procedure by touch when other people would use a, a Doppler probe. Um, so they found that very helpful in surgery. And we used clinical simulators. There were tools to teach how to do uh, blood draws or put in a, a urinary catheter. Um, one of my more exciting experiences, and this goes back to willingness too, is I was on a two-week anesthesiology rotation. And one of the goals for that rotation is for the student to be able to put a breathing tube down a patient. So I showed up on the first day, and one of the anesthesiologists said to me, Tim, I know how you're going to intubate a patient. And I was like, wow, this is great, because I, I, have, I have no clue. Um, <laughs> so he said he, he had a tool, it was called a fast track. It, it kind of has a couple right angle turns. Um, and you can thread, you can use it to thread and then push the, the tube through the, the airway. So we prep the patient, I put the mask over the patient's mouth and nose. I squeeze the bag to make sure they're well oxygenated. The, um, the tones were rising to, to let me know that, they're, um, that we could hear the end title CO2. So we could tell, you can tell when your, um, your tube is in the right place. So I had the, the patient well oxygenated. I pulled off the mask. I guided the breathing tube in. And then I heard the to know that my tube had made it into the right place and we were getting carbon dioxide out of the patient. The patient was breathing. It was at that moment I realized I should start breathing too <laughs> before I passed out. And I went on with my day and went on to do another innovation like that on the, on the rotation. So, so what's my outcome? Well. I independently see dozens of patients a week as a psychiatrist. I do this in a clinic, I do this on a psychiatric unit, and I do it in the emergency department. My specialty is helping people with addictions. So these are people who, in different ways, need to accept their situation, learn and use a variety of different tools to overcome it and to make it irrelevant. Uh, I also supervise and teach medical students. I'm actually the fellowship director for one of our programs at the university. And so when we think of conceptual barriers, by seeing a physician with a disability, hopefully over time that will erode that over those I train and, and among colleagues. So when we look back, adaptation in scientific, scientific medical education involved it using a variety of tools. They're the traditional tools, the braille, uh, etc. The repurposed tools, things like the Opticon, things like the iPhone, things we developed ourselves, like the Tim Mole program. And we benefited from flexibility from the educators, like the anesthesiologist, who was thinking about this problem too, and flexibility on my part. And, it, and we had to keep our focus on the core goals of learning throughout the process, or we could easily get distracted. You know, if you think about this another way, we need to teach with the full spectrum. So some visual spatial ability was used as we went through it, certainly logical, certainly verbal. Um, you could think about the, um, the existential, focus on the goal, the interpersonal, is it working? Next slide. Huh. Next, so we're not actually linked. This is our uh, clutch for the fact my laptop. Okay. Gardner's intelligences? Is that it? Okay. So uh, through the education, um, we, used all, we essentially used all these. 
we used a kinesthetic. Is that right? OK. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, the idea was that Gardner postulated seven, seven different intelligences. And in this process of education along my path, we used all of them. We, we touched on visual, spatial, kinesthetic, using Braille and physical models. We touched on things like the existential, keeping the, the goal in mind, the interpersonal as a psychiatrist the verbal, and of course, the logical. So we think about painting with a full spectrum when, when we educate um, using all these different uh, intelligences. So as we look forward, um, we want to begin with, with the end in mind, keeping that, the goal in focus as, as we design universally. Um, the technical tools will continue to evolve and lower barriers. Um, Design should engage all parties uh, and take advantage of their unique roles and strengths. Um, and when we implement accommodation universally and proactively, all that energy that would have gone into clearing the next hurdle can be put forward to the task at hand and ultimately in, in bettering our world. So that's, I want to thank you. And I'll entertain any questions if people have them. Any questions for Dr. Tim Cordes? I mean, it was a really fascinating um, talk. I never looked on myself no, as a uh, phonatomically dependent person, yeah. Tim. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a really interesting way of flipping the coin and, and looking at it from, from our lens out. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, um, I think, starting to question how we look at things. and. Um, it, it's really, I think it's fascinating to see how we can do things in a completely different way if we start asking all the right questions and take a broader view. So I'm sure some people would like to ask you some questions. Hi there, um, my name's Cathy and I'm from um, University of Brighton in, in England um, and I work alongside a lot of the medical students and one of the things I would like to ask you really is how did you how come you were so confident when you were, or were you not so confident when you started um, medical school? Because I know one of the difficulties I have is actually enabling students to talk openly about um, what their needs might be and to engage, engage them with the conversation because they're so fearful that their peer groups will be constantly undermining their situation. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, when I tell that story about challenging the chair of psychiatry to, uh, to other medical students, they, they cringe. Uh, they, they can't believe that, that someone would, would act in that way. And, and so I think it, you know, over time, uh, I guess what I've always learned is, is courage is being the only one who knows you're afraid. Um, so I, you know, it was clear I couldn't hide my disability. So my next best step, I thought, was to be open about it uh, in as forthright a way, way as I could. Thank you. Oh. Sorry, um, uh, my name is Brian. I just want to ask you there, um, the, Tim. I, uh, uh, you know, um, I suppose as a blind person myself, uh, uh, um, I'm fascinated by the, the number of challenges you've overcome and um, uh, I suppose in, in, in a different way I know what, it, what it's like but um, I wanted to ask you did, you, did you find in overcoming these challenges that you had to compromise uh, at all in the amount of time it took you to, um, I suppose, um, uh, conduct um, so, so, some of these um, that these various occupations that you found yourself getting into. So, so the question is, did I, did I find time? Time, time, time yeah. Was it, yeah. Did it take you a lot longer oh, to find it? Yeah, definitely, did. definitely. Things, things took me longer at, at various places along, along the pathway. And, you know, I, I was able to, to handle it, but, but definitely there were things that, that were slower for me. Yeah, yeah. Not just... Uh, 
um, because the, uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I just find that, I suppose, for visually impaired or blind people, it's in the, the amount of time it can mm -hmm. take to conduct the task. You, you, that, that's where the compromise can, can, can come in. But, um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not up here uh, talking about how I preserved my social life in college, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, so certainly it did, it did take, its, take its toll, uh, a toll I thought was worth it, but yeah. yeah. Thanks. My name is Cheryl Murphy, um, and I wanted to know, because you had to think so deeply and critically about how you were approaching each problem, did that transfer into the, um, the subject area of your studies? Did you find that you were able to solve medical problems or scientific problems more readily because you were so thinking critically all the time about everything else? I, I think so. So, so the other part I, I didn't mention here is, so my, um, my father was an engineer. Uh, and so from the youngest age, I had pushed into my head, get the job done, son. Let's get the job done. And so whenever I'd approach a problem, I would say, well, how am I going to get this job done? And, and my, my mother was quite supportive and emotionally available. So, so drawing from both of those things from an early age when I'd approach a problem, it was that, yes, how, how, am, I going to, how am I going to get this job done? And as a psychiatrist now, I focus a lot on function. How, how are you, as a patient, going to get the job you want to do done, done? And, and so I think it, it has carried over into to what I do. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Tim, yeah. uh, Tony Ward from the University of York in England. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for a, for a fantastic talk, um, really inspiring. Um, and clearly, with your visual disability, you've, you've overcome a massive amount, and you're also trained as a psychologist. So can I ask you, um, of the ideas and concepts you put forward today, how many of them do you think translate directly across to, the, to students with mental disabilities? Yeah, so as, as a psychiatrist, I, I think in, in broad strokes, I think a lot of these things these cr cross over. The, the challenge with the mental disability and, and mental illness is, you know, I talked about neuroplasticity and how the brain can change. Well, in, in mental illness, the, the brain itself can change too in, in, with the disorder. So it's, it, there can be layers on this. And, and so I think, you know, overgeneralization can, can create problems, but I think there are similarities. Because I, for example, I work with addiction and, and recovery involves, you know, often accepting your situation and then taking concrete steps to, to work work on your core problem. And that, that does have some parallels to, to the disability field, I think. Thank you.